Now, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents with God's Church of Love every Saturday and Tuesday. And we are dealing with who God is in the middle of it all. Listen to this, y'all. God knows what's going on. Listen. Verse 41. Nothing is catching him by surprise. And I read. Nothing. And behold, there came a man named Jairus. And he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For behold, excuse me, for he had only one daughter. Check that out. He had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And then, uh, you know, uh, somebody gets healed and all that. The issue comes out. Now we go to verse 49. While he yet spake, he was speaking to the woman with the issue of blood that got healed. While he yet spake, verse 49, <clears throat> there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house. That's from Jairus's house saying to him, thy daughter, listen to this y'all, thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. Now, right there, sounds like the end of the story, doesn't it? Right there, mm -hmm. sounds like case closed. Right there, sounds like no more hope. Story ends. Let's move on to something different because that is history. Verse 50. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying what? What, Jeanette, what did he answer him saying? Do not be sick with alarm or struck with fear. Simply believe in me and be able to do this, and she shall be made well. Now, I'm going to read it verbatim. Fear not. The same thing Jeanette didn't even know that I was going right. to read this. That's amazing. That ain't nothing but the Holy Ghost. Believe Believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, weep not. She is not dead, but sleepeth. Now when God says something, I don't care she is dead. If God says she sleepeth, she's no longer dead. Hello. Yeah. That's right. Now, check this out. And he put them out. Why did he put them out? All the people they, that laughed him to scorn. Yeah. yeah, verse 53. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. See, that was a fact, a matter of fact. The girl died. Bottom line. But God said a word, and the word changed everything. That's right. Right. You know now, what the word was? In the book of, I believe it's Matthew, the Bible says that Jesus said, Talitha Komai, which means little girl wrapped in the word of God, come forth. There you Amen. go. There you Amen. go. Now, verse 52, and all wept and bewailed her. I want you to hear this. I want you to see this scene. All wept and bewailed her. Why were they weeping? Because she was dead. In their understanding, clinically, in all ways, shape, and form, she was dead. But he said, weep not. She is not dead. That, that that undid the dead right there. Oh, that reversed God. it. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And what did he do with them? He put them out. He put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. Now, what my cousin quoted was the same story from another chapter and verse. Okay. Yeah. So she said correctly. She was just reading from another 
another chapter and verse. Same story. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished. All right, now, listen, listen, I want to stop there because I just wanted to read to verse 55. See, there are times in our lives when there seems to be nothing but death around us. Death, failure, loss, end of things, end of good things, end of good people, end of good situations. It seems like all the good that you had is now gone and now there's nothing left but a, a season of mourning. It seems like mourning goes on and on and on. It seems like loss. It's like from one loss to another loss, from the fire to the, from the, from the frying pan to the fire, from, from falling into the lake to drowning in the lake. I mean, we just, it just seems like when all hell breaks loose, there is no more hope. That's what it looks like. That's what the That's people, right. when they laughed him to scorn, that's why they laughed him to scorn. They knew she was dead. She was dead. She absolutely was. It was uh -huh. him, Peter, James, John, father uh -huh. and the mother. But it uh -huh. said, and all wept and bewailed her. There were already people in there. Oh, I'm see, sorry. see, they were already there. He brought the, he and his group came in, yeah. but these people were already in there bewailing her. Those are the people that laughed him to scorn, and they're the ones he put out. That's why it's always good when you pray for someone to be healed. If you think there's anybody in there that doubts or that will mock in their heart, yeah, it's better for them to be put that. out. Put them out. I agree with that, honey. I, that's I right. That at the, in my nursing home, I, I would have to literally, family members, if you don't believe, can you step out and the ones who believe stay in the room? Right. Exactly. Literally, yeah. Is, exactly. And, and don't be condemned if you don't believe. Just don't be in here with us because we don't need it. Exactly. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. So now, this is what happens in our lives, y'all. A lot of times life hits us in a place where we think all is lost. We think all hope is lost. It's over for me now. There's nothing else for me to look forward to. God has punished me. God has allowed the devil to win in my life. It's all over. It's a lost cause. They, they said I'm going to die. They said I got this. They said I got that. They're going to take the house. They're going to close my bank account. They're going to fire me from the job. It's all, in, you know, what's the use? It's worthless. What's the point in trying? Well, let me show you something. This is what I love about God. Listen to this. Let's go to a few more scriptures just so you can reference. Listen, there are times when God proclaims something. He knows something's going to go down a certain way. We don't. We're in the bottom of the barrel. We don't know what's going on above and around the barrel. We just know what's going on in the barrel because we can only see so far. Listen. Let's go to Matthew 9. I mean, Mark 9. Excuse me. That's how I got them mixed up, y'all. I know I'm a little cuckoo, but I'll be all right. Okay. Mark 9. I hear you laughing, Jeanette. Okay, let's see. Mark, Mark 9. And there comes a point where he tells the disciples. I'm scrolling down. He tells the disciples something's getting ready to happen now the disciples don't know it here it is verse 31 that's the only one i want to read verse 31 for he taught his disciples and said unto them the son of man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him and after 
after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Now, Jesus said in other scriptures, I am the resurrection and the life. He said that he talked about his resurrection power right before he raised Lazarus. He waited four days when he went to minister to Lazarus. His sisters were telling him, what the heck? I'm putting this in everyday terms, okay? What the heck are you doing here now? Where were you when we needed you? Yeah, now you come strolling up here after he's been in the tomb. By now he stinks. And now you come. Thanks for being there. Imagine the attitude. Imagine how they felt knowing that Jesus and Lazarus were friends. They weren't just acquaintances. They were friends. And Jesus was not there when they needed him to heal him. No, Jesus let the brother die. Isn't that something? Why God allows some things, we don't get it and it makes us angry. And we do get a fat attitude sometimes. Some of you have walked away from God. Some of you on YouTube have walked away from God and talked to the hand. I ain't got time for a God that won't be there for me. Why? You prayed for this and he allowed that. And you don't like it. And some of you won't admit how angry you are with God. But you're angry with God. Like Mary and, and, and Martha. Right. Here their brothers laying in the tomb, stinking, de decomposing already. And now he comes. Well, what you going to do now? He's dead. What you going to do now, Jesus? He's dead. It's over. What's the point? Think about it. But there are times when God moves in the most hopeless situations. When you can't find an answer, when nobody has a solution, nobody has the money, nobody has the wherewithal, nobody knows what to do, and it's a lost cause. Sometimes that's what it looks like we're living in in these times right now. We look at, at, at the powers that be. We look at the big P. We look at the P coming up. I'm talking in code right now. And we wonder, what the heck is all this mess about? It's a mess. It's a lost cause. We're flushing ourselves down the toilet. What's the point? You have a God. Fear not. You have a God that is in total control. What does Psalms 24 say? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein and all that dwell there. God is in control. The devil could not attack Job without God's permission. He went into God's presence to ask him permission to attack Job so he could watch Job curse God to his face. That was literally a wager he, he pulled with God. God knew who Job was. God knew what was up in here. And he knew he could trust him to go through hell for his name's sake. Because he knew when he came out on the other end, he already knew what his blessings were going to be. He had his blessings all stacked up in the storehouse, lined up, set up, sitting up on the side wing of the stage, sitting there waiting for their appearance to present themselves to Job. He got double for his trouble. See, we think that because all hell is breaking loose now, there is nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide. We don't know because we're looking at the situation through our eyes and our little pea brain trying to figure things out. You cannot figure it out. Whatever God allows, God 
already has the solutions for. What did he say? The son of man is delivered into the hands of man. That hadn't happened yet. He's talking in the present tense. They don't know it. They don't know the plan of God. And they shall, not they might, not they're planning to. They shall kill him. That cannot happen without God. God is sovereign. Nobody can go up against the sovereignty of God. Nobody. Not the big T, not the big B, not the present P, not the next P coming up, up behind them. Nobody. All right, listen. Now, when I do this video, I will put the words up so you'll know what I'm saying. But for AI's sake, we're going to keep this under, under the cuff. That's why I'm talking like that. All right. No matter what goes on, some of you think that the big A, our domain is going to crumble and it will be no more. But I'm going to tell you, God always has what he establishes as cities of refuge. And you will have pockets all over the nation where the saints can be safe. The saints can run and hide under the shadow of the Almighty. They hide under his wings, shall we trust. We will be in his hiding place. We will be under his divine protection. And there will only be some things happening to some of the saints because Jesus did say, pray to the Lord of the harvest that you can be found worthy of escaping what's to come. That means not all are going to go through that. So this is a very, very good time to draw real close to him. Get all up under God's armpits, y'all, because I'm telling you, God may consider you worthy to escape the crap. Just because it's going down doesn't mean it has to go down on you. Just because all hell is breaking loose doesn't mean you can't have heaven in your immediate circle, in your immediate sphere of influence, in your house in your car, in your circumstances. You can have heaven while everyone else is catching hell. Yes, in the middle of it, you can escape. Yes, you can. You know how I know that? Because Jesus walked to the boat. Excuse me, let me put it, let me say it right. They woke him up from the bottom of the boat. He came up. And all the waves were whipping and the wind was roaring and they were so afraid. As King James doesn't say they were so afraid. They were so afraid. Right. But listen, they were so afraid. They just knew they were about to perish. And what did they tell him? Wake up. Get up. Get up. We're about to perish. And he gets up there and he's like, oh, how long will I deal with you? Okay, peace be still immediate hush see in your circle in your life in your situation all you got to do is call out to God and ask him to speak peace be still in your situation and while the wind is whipping across the street and the tornado is is, is whipping all over your neighborhood tearing down homes he can speak, peace be still, around you. And your house could actually be the only one left standing because of God's word. Now, when you look at what he said, he said, they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he, not might, y'all pray that this happen. No, he shall rise the third day now they didn't know what that meant because they, they didn't get it but guess what and it said in verse 32 
but they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. <coughs> Excuse me. God knows every challenge, every demonic attack, every problem, every situation. He knows everything that is lined up with our name on it. He knows what's aimed at us. He knows what's working against us and why. But guess what? He says in Isaiah, I will go ahead of you. Listen to this. I'll make the crooked places straight. So crooked, he makes it straight. And the rough places, he makes smooth. He makes plain, as King James says it. Listen, God goes ahead of your problem. God goes ahead of your crisis. God goes ahead of your sickness. God goes ahead of your loss. God goes ahead of the attacks that are on you. And he, his word says, and you shall, whatever his plan is. And if his plan is to bring you home to be with him, your family will be all right as long as they stay close to God. God has, let me share this real quick. This, 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 this might help you see what I mean. Sometimes God allows the worst to happen, right? We look at the worst case scenario as death. We look at the worst case scenario as loss, right? But listen to this. This is what I love about God. Now, I'm going to come out of the Bible and I'm going to go back in time. We're going to go down memory lane and we're going to talk about my personal experience. Now listen, when I was 27 years old, I got saved in September 1981. Gave my heart to the Lord, accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior came out from the nightclubs and all the other clubs that I was, yeah. Now, my father was in the hospital because he had fallen and cracked his skull. And they expected him to die, but God had other plans. My father was 80 years old. And the reason he fell off the roof was because he was up there. He was in excellent health, y'all. He should have lived into his hundreds, 103, 105. He was in excellent health. That man was on the roof fixing the antenna at 80. Mm hmm at 79, he changed all my brake drums on my car. The man was by it. Now, listen. Here he was in great health. He falls, cracks his skull, has all kind of complications from 1980 to 81. And now he's back in the hospital. And they're expecting him to say, I still a bye-bye. But God had other plans. Because my father was not saved. I was. And the very daughter that did not want anybody talking to me about taking care of anybody begged God after she got saved to let me take care of him and give back to him just some of the love he shared with me all his life. Now, here he is at home with me now. Check it out. <clears throat> My father gave his heart to the Lord at 80 Almost 80, yeah, 81 years of age. By then he had turned 81. 81, he gave his heart to the Lord. Now what I want to share with you is God worked miracle after miracle throughout that whole thing. His legs hurt, I massaged it and prayed over it, pain gone. He had problems with his bowels. I put the glove on, did the rotor rooter thing, cleared out the passageway, he was good. The next thing, it was one thing after the other, and God just gave me solution after solution. Fine. He did well. But the Lord, check it out. 
met in May of 1982, I kissed my father on his forehead and he drew his last breath and his eyes closed. He stopped breathing. His eyes popped open and went in a perfect circle. They looked like doll baby eyes because the pupils had dilated so, so far. I knew his spirit had left his body, but now I had to deal with me because my father was my hero, y'all. He was a wonderful father and I knew he was on his way out. But I still had to deal with the mourning, the hurt, the pain. God allowed my father to die. He took him out of his misery. Now, check it out. That night, I'm telling you this so you understand how sovereign God is. That night, the saints came over. I'm so moved because I'm so grateful for all that God does in our darkest hours. He's right there, y'all. The pastor came over. A lot of the saints came over. Sister Anna Mae came over. and She was uh, the former pastor's wife, and, and, you know, she was a powerful woman. So, anyway, it was about eight or nine of us, including my sister and my niece. And we were in there. Uh, you know, they were there to just comfort me, right? Now, after we had gone to the hospital, they told me my father had died. We went back to the house. Now it's about 11 or 12 midnight. And the pastor said, do you have a prayer request? Would you like us to pray for anything specific for you? And I said, yes. I'm having flashbacks of my father dying. And every time I have the flashbacks, it hurts like it did when it happened. And I also want to, it was, it was a couple of things that, oh, I asked, I wanted God to shorten my mourning process. I knew that mourning was natural, but I was, the whole assignment of taking care of my father was to usher him into God's presence for eternity. And I knew that. I didn't want to mourn that. So I asked God to help me get the mourning over with at one time. Yeah, I asked weird prayers. Sister Anna Mae prayed for me. I used to hang out with that woman. She was in her, in her 80s, but I used to hang out with her. She was such a spiritual powerhouse. Beautiful. Anyway. She prayed for me exactly what I asked. The flashback stopped that night. The flashback stopped. I didn't have another flashback after she prayed that prayer. And I was having them back to back, constantly seeing my father's eyes open wide and go in a circle. Now, after that, everybody left and it was just me, my niece, and Peggy and my sister Evelyn. And we hung around the house for about an hour and I'm just because I'm full of adrenaline. <clears throat> we left the house. I want you to hear how in control God is during some of our darkest moments. We got in the car. We said, let's get out of the house. We got in the car. We drove up to Lake Avenue I mean, I'm sorry, we went to a, um, an all-night cafe, and we sat there, and I'm just, yak, 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 yak. and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, I start bawling, and I was crying my eyes out. When I got through crying my eyes out, we left and went to a park and watched the sun come up. Now, this is approximately 11... I mean, approximately five hours or six hours after they pronounced my father dead. And here I am sitting in the car with my sister and my niece. And I told them, I've done a video on this. I told them, and I'm going to condense it for now. I felt like I was hovering in outer space. I felt like there was no sound, no feeling, no pain, no movement, no nothing just beauty and peace. 
And I said, this must be what the Bible talks about when it says the peace that passes all understanding. I told him, I don't feel any more mourning. I don't feel any more sadness. It's gone. I never felt any more mourning. After I cried it out that one time at the restaurant, I cried for about two hours. It was over. It was gone. And then God gave me a dream that my father came back to let me know he was on his way to heaven. He made it. Now, I'm done with that now. But what I want to share with you is no matter how ugly the situation, no matter how bitter the loss, no matter how deep it cuts, God is your Novocaine. God is your pain killer. God is your healer. He is the suture that sews you back together again when you've been cut so wide open. God knows what to do to help you. He is a very present help. He knows how to dry your weeping eyes. Just I was telling Lynette at the beginning of this service, the other night I was, I was going through changes, just going through the, you know, the woe is me stuff, going through my own little personal battles. There wasn't nothing going wrong in my life. I just had my own little things that were disappointing to me. And I, I, I cried to God about it. God led me from scripture to scripture to scripture to scripture. And before I knew it, I was sitting up there relaxing, playing music. My eyes were dry. I had done crying. The hurt was gone. The loneliness was gone. It, I'm telling you, God will minister to you through the pain or he will bring a miracle out of the pain like he did with his resurrection, like he did with Lazarus. He raised Lazarus from the dead after he had already begun to decompose. This was for the glory of God. That's why he waited because he was supposed to wait. Sometimes in your situation, God wants you to see everything come to a close where there is no hope, where there are no answers. There's nowhere else to run, nowhere to hide, no help to get. Everything looks hopeless. And then God says, now I've got you where I need you to be. Be still and see the salvation of the Lord. Not the salvation of your rich uncle, not the salvation of the government, not the salvation of, of your good gambling luck that, you know, you... You able to win this lottery or win? No, no, no. See the salvation of the Lord. God knows how to pull you out. When all is impossible, he is the God of the impossible. All things are possible with him. All things. There's not one thing he cannot do except lie. He will not lie. He's not a man that he should lie. Stand on his promises, y'all. Ask God. Listen, when you're going through a quandary and you're not sure what's really going on or why or how long, ask God to give you some personal promises. And when he gives you a personal promise, he can lead you to scripture. He led me to Psalms 91 when I didn't know what Psalms 91 even said. And that was my promise of long life and good health. That's what I was asking him for, to let me know what was going on with my body. And God led me to that scripture. And I wrote down Psalms 91, God's promise to me of long life and good health. Now, 
I went to church three years later with a lump in my breast to get prayed for that the lump would be gone. And the man called me out of the line, told me, go sit down somewhere. Didn't God promise you Psalms 91? The man didn't know me from Adam. I knew then I was okay. Another year and a half later, lump was gone. It didn't go that night, but I believed. And a year and a half later, couldn't be found, gone. See, <laughs> God is in control. If you could just understand, God is in control, y'all. God knows how to get you from point A to point B. Listen, oh, I'm trying to end this message. One time I was out swimming at the ocean and a rip tide, uh, it, th there was a rip tide and this wave knocked me, just hit me all upside the head, knocked me topsy turvy. Well, I know the first thing you got to do in water is refuse to allow yourself to panic because it's the panic that kills, not the water. And if you keep your mind about you, you can get out of that just fine. Let the water work for you. Not again, don't work against the water. Let the water work with you. So what I did was I told myself, settle, wait. As soon as something bumps up against you, that will be the bottom. That will be where you put your feet. And as much as I wanted to suck in wind, I just kept fighting it and something bumped me on my shoulder put my feet there, pushed up, and bam, I was at the top. I was at the surface. Now, this is what happened. Another wave came, and guess what that wave did? That wave dragged me all the way to shore. See, there are times when God allows the waves of opposition, the waves of adversity to hit you on your left, hit you on your right, hit you upside the head on your blind side, knock you in your jaw, give you a black eye. The blindsided waves of adversity can tear you and rip you in all directions. But God knows to send that one wave to get you to safety. And that's where you have to trust in God to get you there. You got to trust in God when all the elements are working against you. God is your only trust. God is your only safety. God is your lifeguard. <sighs> God is. Listen, when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, all that has happened against you, divorce, loss of child, loss of bank account, loss of house, all that you mourn in your life. God knows how to heal your heart. God knows how to put, the, the, to put you back together again. The potter wants to put you back together again. He knows how to heal. He knows how to erase the pain. He knows how to remove the fear, remove the threat, Remove the person that is threatening you. He knows what to do, y'all. All power is in his hands. And I'm going to end there. God bless you. Be encouraged. Know in whom. Listen, the Bible says know them that labor among you. Well, the biggest laborer among you is God. It know the one in whom you believe. Know him. Get to know him. The Bible will help you see how he works so that when all hell breaks loose, you're not falling apart with the stuff that's falling apart around you. Let God keep you. Let God hold you. And when all settles, let him land you on your feet, on a solid rock, on a solid foundation. And he will leave you in a large place, as the Bible says. Which means you'll be way better off after the problem than you were before. God bless you. Be encouraged. And I'm done.